evening. My name is J.D. Greer, and I'm a pastor of a local church here called the Summit Church uh, in the Raleigh-Durham area. I have the privilege of serving as pastor to a number of college students uh, that are a part of our church. They make up one of the absolute best dimensions of who we are. Uh, a lot of uh, students from UNC Chapel Hill, uh, Duke University, NC State, North Carolina Central, and kind of everywhere in between. Uh, and so they make our church very interesting. I always say that having that many college students at our church means a few things about us. Uh, number one, church unity is a very, very difficult challenge for us, particularly around this time of year. Uh, we, when I was backstage with one of our worship leaders getting ready to go out on to you know, for, begin the service, and it was a Duke student, and he had a, a shirt on that said, go to hell, Carolina. And I was like, man, you cannot have a, a, a shirt on stage that tells anybody to go to hell when you get up and lead worship. He's like, but it's, it's different. I was like, no, it's not different. Uh, so church unity is a problem for us. Uh, the other thing I always say is that we are dirt poor as a congregation, relatively speaking, because college students bring a lot of things to our church. Money is not one of those things. Uh, I remember when college students first began to come to our church back uh, probably a decade or so ago, um, one week uh, it was. Uh, with, we probably had three, 400 people in the church at that point. Uh, one week there was a car showed up, two cars, and they had five college students in those two cars. They came in. Uh, I guess they liked the service because next week, next week, they came back with 500 of their friends um, out of the same two cars, by the way, uh, that it's all sort of piled out of there. Uh, during that little season of our church, our average weekly attendance basically tripled, and our average weekly offering went down $13.48 uh, during that time. Uh, one of my favorite memories as a pastor is in between two of our, our worship services, um, one of our, our ushers comes back in the little backstage area and he has um, an offering plate and in it is a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit from a college student, from McDonald's. He just put it right in there. And there's a little note attached to a little post-it note that says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. So we are dirt poor as a congregation. But we also know the third thing is that we have a lot of potential missionaries and a lot of students who are asking the question, um, where and how has God called me to go? We always say that the question is no longer if you are called. We say the question is simply where and how. And so that has led us to one of the most fruitful partnerships that we have had as a church, and that is right here with Southeastern Seminary and Southeastern Baptist College. Uh, that is right here. It has been a wonderful thing. I can say this. Uh, I'm probably not supposed to say it because of some other responsibilities that I have, but this is by far the best training institution, Christian institution on the face of the earth. Uh, I can say that not because, listen, I ain't getting paid to say this. They ain't paying me anything for that. I got to pay my own miles coming all the way over here, okay? So um, it's, there's nothing best today interest, but having been twice a graduate of this place and also seen so many of our, our college students and seminary students that um, find definition and um, equipping for what God has called them to do. It's a wonderful partnership, and so I am absolutely delighted and honored to be here to be with my one of my best friends in ministry, and that is President Danny Aiken right down here, who you will hear from later on this evening. You should consider me the, um, the appetizer, uh, the opening act, the guy nobody's ever heard of that opens up for the big star coming right after me, Danny Aiken. So anyway, all right, well, how many of you, let's see, I know this is mostly college students, some high school students, seminary students, but how many, anybody in here married? Just raise your hand. You're married? Okay, actually, that's a good number. Uh, how many of you want to be married if you're not married? By, by the way, if you are married, your hand definitely has to be up, okay? You want to be married? Um, all right, so I know that would probably be the majority of you. Um, one of the things that they did not cover in my premarital counseling is the difficulty of choosing a name for your children. I've had to do it four times, as I know Dr. Aiken has as well, and that is a process that will absolutely test the strength of your relationship because there's all these kinds of rules that they never tell you about in premarital counseling. For example, if you or your spouse ever dated anybody with a certain name, then that name is off limits forever now until the end of the world. Do not even suggest it for the dog. Definitely not for one of your kids. Um, if you, as a husband, suggest a name for a girl that reminds your spouse of a girl that she did not like in high school for any reason whatsoever, that name is also off limits. And then you just got to think through the first and last names very carefully and how first names will potentially pair with other future last names. If not, then you are like the Mann family, a family that I know, the Mann family, who named their daughter Anita and sentenced their daughter to go through life declaring Anita Mann, Anita Mann, every time somebody asked her name. 
you can see how that would be a problem. I recently stumbled onto a list of unfortunate name combinations of actual people. Uh, these are not made up. For example, one person named their daughter Eileen Wright. Eileen Wright. You could just see that that would at least be a little awkward uh, when you were getting certain conversations off the ground. There was another one, though I think this one is actually awesome. Lois Price. Lois, I don't know, it just makes me feel close to God when I say that. Lois Price, I'd like to know her. Um, there was another one, there's another one lady, I kid you not, her name was Helen, who married a guy with the last name Back. Helen Back. After 10 years of marriage, this guy said, I think that might have been prophetic, however, just for whatever it's worth. Perhaps the worst one was Keisha May, who had the last name Ash. Keisha May, you just don't even want to go there, okay? So you got to think that through. Names are important. Names are important because they reveal a lot about us, right? Your name is supposed to carry some connotation of who you are and what you're about. So it is very important for us to note that when God promises to send a Messiah, one of the most prominent names that he gave to that Messiah was the name Father. If you got a Bible, I want you to open it this evening to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Now, let me freely confess to you um, that what I'm going to do here in the session I have with you is not what you would call a classic, what some people call an expository sermon, where I'm just going to work my way through one text. I'm going to use a concept that I think is very important about the Messiah, and I'm going to take you to a number of places. You can certainly try to keep up with me. Uh, if you've got a Bible there and you're really good at finding stuff, or if you, uh, you're, you know, you're, your parents are rich and, and you wear skinny jeans and you've got an iPad, you can turn your Bible on and try to scroll there with me. Um, that's fine. Uh, but just realize that I'm going to be moving through a lot of different texts here as we go on tonight. I would suggest to you, here, here's the verse, 9 verse 6. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. I would suggest to you that if there were ever anything that you and I needed in a Savior, any relationship that we needed to be redeemed and restored, it is that of Everlasting Father. The whole theme of this conference over the next couple days is who God is and how who He is shapes who you are and who you see yourself to be identity. Our identity ends up coming from our understanding of who God is and how he's created us. A.W. Tozer, very famously, there's a statement you may have heard. Uh, he says, the most important thing about a man, the most important thing about a man or a woman is what they think about God. What a man thinks about God is the most important and most defining thing about him because it will determine literally everything else in your life. How you see yourself, how you deal with trials, how you deal with, um, with, uh, with, with, with difficulties and triumphs, and what you see with the future of your life. Um, when we talk about the overall name of this conference, GO, uh, we're talking about our identity so that you'll have confidence to go. You will never have the identity that gives you the confidence to go until you understand Jesus as the everlasting Father. So this conference is all about how you see God. And I would say that maybe the most important element in understanding God is understanding him as father. Some of you, some of you listening to me right now, you had great dads, you have great dads. And your memories of your dad, your relationship with your dad, it's, 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 they're fond memories and cherished memories. But I know that for many of you in an audience this size, you did not have a great relationship with your dad and you do not have a great relationship with him. And maybe some of the greatest pain in your life even now comes from your relationship with him. Maybe he was never there. Maybe he was never there. Maybe he abandoned you when you were, were very little. And, and, and by the way, maybe it wasn't even his fault. Maybe he died early. Bottom line was he still wasn't there during some very pivotal moments when you felt like you needed him. Or maybe he was physically present, but he wasn't really there, if you know what I mean. He was always too busy and too distracted and never really paid that much attention to you. Or maybe all you can remember from your dad is how disappointed, how disappointed he always seemed to be with you. Or maybe, maybe you just never really felt any connection to him. It's the kind of relationship where when you call home and he answers the phone and he hears that it's you on the other end of the line, he calls for your mom to come get the phone because he doesn't know how to have a meaningful conversation with you. Or maybe he was abusive. In an audience this size, there's a lot of people I know who were physically or even sexually abused by their, their fathers. For whatever reason, there's a lot of pain that gets brought up in you when, when you think about, about your dad. And so when I say that Jesus wants to be your everlasting father, you're not exactly sure what to do with that. There's a guy at our church named Jonathan Edwards, not the Puritan Jonathan Edwards. He's not a member of our church, but just named Jonathan Edwards. Uh, he wrote a great article. It got picked up by the Gospel Coalition. 
He, it was about the difficulty that he's had to learn in, calling, in learning to call God his father because of the difficult relationship he had with his earthly father. He says, let me quote, I was 25 years old before I could say the word father while praying because of the kind of relationship or lack thereof that I had with my dad. It just didn't roll off my tongue in prayer the way it did for many of my Christian friends. How could I come to God without fear when I'd been scared to go home whenever dad was there? How could I understand God's love and faithfulness when dad left town because he loves something or somebody more than me? How can God be a mighty fortress of protection when my dad hit instead of hugged? Unfortunately, this is the experience of a lot of people in our society. And again, I would even suspect a lot of people in this room. And as Jonathan, my friend, indicates, this ends up having a powerful shaping influence on your understanding of God. And until you address this, until you understand this, you're never going to be able to trust God. The words in the song that we sang just a minute ago are just words. But you don't know what it's like to commit your life to him because you've never been able to trust somebody that you called father. A sociologist named Vern Bangston wrote a book called Families and Faith in which he shows, listen to this, studies conclusively show that the quality of the child's relationship to the father is the single most important factor in whether or not the child adopts the faith of the parents. In fact, he points out almost all of the famous atheists of modernity, Sigmund Freud, Friedrich Nietzsche, Jean-Paul Sartre, Hume, Bertrand Russell, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, all of them, he points out, had one thing in common, and that was an absentee father or an abusive father or a traumatic relationship with their father. No less than Sigmund Freud noted, nothing is more common than for a young person to lose faith in God when he loses respect for his father. And of course, just beyond our faith, our relationships with our dads end up being the most shaping influences on how we approach life in general. National statistics show that 71% of high school dropouts, 71% come from fatherless homes. 75% of teenagers in substance abuse centers come from fatherless homes. One of these studies claimed that, quote, almost every social ill faced by America's children is related to fatherlessness. One California study noted that 98% of its discipline issues were caused by emotionally damaged young boys whose common characteristic was father loss. So what I want to do, what I want to do in this session in talking about your identity being based on who God is, I want to identify four types of, let's call them dysfunctional fathers or four types of father wounds and show you how Jesus came to heal those and what it means for us to say that he is the everlasting father in the midst of that kind of brokenness. By the way, I borrow these categories from a book called Father Factor, how your father's legacy impacts your career. I'm gonna use the author's um, four different types of dysfunctional um, fathers as an anchor point, as a grid for this message, because when I read them, I think it's a perfect way to show what Jesus did for us when God declared him to be our everlasting father. Now, one very quick theological thing that I, I wanna clear up before we get going, um, just so it's not confusing, all right? At first, calling Jesus the everlasting father may seem odd, since the Bible very clearly teaches that Jesus is the second member of the Trinity, which we refer to as God's son. Yet here in Isaiah 9, verse 6, the son is called the father. That does not mean that Jesus has switched places with God the father in the Trinity. It just means that Jesus, in his relationship to us, was going to be like the Father that we've always longed for. And in a sense, in calling Jesus this, you and I press a little bit into the mystery of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is that God exists in three persons. Each of the persons is different and separate from the others, but each is fully and completely God. So in experiencing one of them, you experience all of them, the full Godhead. Got him Michael Reeves in a great little book called Delighting in the Trinity. He says that Father might be the most important and foundational aspect of understanding God. He said, after all, Father is the one thing that God never became. God became a creator when he created. He became a savior when he died for us. But because God has existed eternally as a Trinity, he has always been a Father. Michael Reeves, it's not that he has a nice blob of fatherly icing on top. He creates as a father. He rules as a father. He saves as a father. He is a father all the way through. 
Another theologian, J.I. Packer, would say it this way. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, if you want to know how much they understand it in their heart, find out how much he or she makes of the thought of being God's child, how much it means to them to have God as his father. If that is not the thought that prompts and controls their worship and prayers and their whole outlook on life, well, it means he doesn't really understand Christianity very, very well at all. So, of course, when you experience Jesus, you experience the Father. In fact, Jesus said he came to show us the Father. And y'all, I know if you think about that for a long time, it's, the Trinity is very confusing. How was the Father not the Son, but they're both God, and God is only one being, and so when you experience the Son, you experience the Father. That's a confusing concept. But, you know, just, let me just kind of alleviate something. It shouldn't surprise you that the mystery, that the doctrine of God kind of blows your mind. Um, there's a great little book um, by a, a, a British mathematician named Edwin Abbott. It's called Flatlands. It's about 100 years old. He had one of the best descriptions of why this is so difficult for us to understand things like the Trinity and understand things like um, God's sovereignty. He said, imagine, just hang with me here. He said, imagine that the creation was only two-dimensional so that, that you know, God had created everything in a two-dimensional plane and all we were were dots in this little plane, just going you know, this way and that way. The God who created us was a three-dimensional God, like a sphere. And so one day the sphere wants to reveal himself to the dots. How does he do that? He can't explain you know, a third dimension because the poor little dots have no capacity to understand the third dimension. So what if this sphere decided, watch this, that he was just going to pass through the plane. That's how he was gonna reveal himself. So what would happen? He would, you know, when, when, when the sphere, the basketball touches the plane, it would start as a dot, it would expand to a circle, and it would shrink back to a dot. He said, imagine the poor dots trying to explain to one another what just happened. Is God a dot or is he a circle or is he both? They just don't have the categories to really understand it. He said, how much more when we're talking about things like the Trinity to understand that God is one being, yet he is three persons. And we say, I just don't understand it. Now, one of the best analogies that I've ever heard for the Trinity, actually, it comes from a guy named Timothy the first, who in the first ever interaction between a Christian theologian and a Muslim, uh, Claire, this is back in like 750 AD or something like that. Uh, Timothy the first with the Caliph, he was describing the Trinity. He said, this, this has been my favorite analogy I've ever encountered. He said, he said, you know, when you, when you think a thought, when you think a thought, your mind forms the word, you have a brain that forms the thought, it forms it into words. I'm hot, right? I, I feel you know, physically hot. So you form it into words and then your vocal cords, they, voice the wind and create the vibrations that carry the message along to your ears. He said, you've got three different components, right? You've got the mind that thinks the thought, you've got the words that express the thought, and then you've got the vibrations in the air that carry the thought to your ears. In hearing the statement, I'm hot, you would never say, okay, I heard three different things. You only heard one thing. And you would never separate the thought from the words or the words from the vibrations that carried them. In the act of hearing one, you actually experienced all three. He said in the Bible, God the Father is the mind, the Jesus is the word of God, and the spirit is, is the, the wind that carries the understanding of God to our hearts. That's about the best I can do in an analogy, but the bottom line is this. When you are experiencing Jesus, you are experiencing the everlasting Father, which is why Isaiah feels full freedom in saying, we're going to call him everlasting Father, even though he's the second person of the Godhead, God the Son. Does that make sense? That's the end of my little theological ellipsis there, okay? In experiencing the Father, everlasting Father, we experience, or experiencing Jesus, we experience the Father, because that's what we most needed to have restored to us in the Savior. So again, let's look at the four different kinds of dysfunctional dads. Let's look at the wounds that they leave behind. And then we'll look at, at how Jesus heals them. Number one, if you're taking notes, there is the never satisfied dad. The never satisfied dad. This was the dad who, no matter what you did, he just never seemed to be proud of you. I, I know a pastor's wife who said that her dad was this way. She said he wasn't unkind, was never abusive, but she just never heard the words, I'm proud of you from his lips. She never sensed from him the affection that would make her feel special. She, she said that she was the first person in her family ever to go to college. Not only did she go, she graduated top of her class, 4.0 in all of her classes with academic honors. She said, as my graduation approached, she said, you know what I was dreaming about? You know what I was dreaming about in graduation? I wasn't dreaming about walking across the stage, everybody cheering, getting all those different accolades and getting all the things hung around my neck and the award for being top of my class. I was dreaming about walking down from the stage 
and my dad pressing through the crowd and finally in front of everybody to just look at me and say, honey, I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you and I love you. She said, the moment came. It was just like in my dream, exactly like what I imagined. She said, my dad, I saw him pushing through the crowd to get to me. And she thought, this is it. This is the moment I've waited for all my life. She said, the moment he gets up to me, what did he say? The words that came out of his mouth were, well, it's getting late. It's a long drive home. We better get going. She said, I was crushed, absolutely crushed. Years later, she said, it still affects how I approach my job. It still affects what I need from my husband. It affects how I relate to my friends. So you see, for kids who grow up in this kind of home, proving themselves to others becomes the dominating theme of their lives. Understandably, they carry this perspective of themselves into their relationship with God. Whatever you do, whatever you do, you've got this nagging, unspoken doubt in your heart. Have I done enough? Or you think, I, I bet God would be happier with me if I were a, a better Christian, if I were a better witness, if I were a better daughter, if I would go to the mission field. You constantly compare yourself to others and you say, well, I bet if I were like that guy, I bet if I were like her, then, then God would be happy with me. But see, your heavenly father could not be more different than this. Isaiah says that we as God's children are precious to God. Precious is a very strong word. Precious means that he could not imagine doing life without you. He tells us in Isaiah that he pays more attention to us than a mother thinks about her newborn infant. Isaiah 49 verse 15, can a woman forget her nursing child? Could a woman have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will never forget you. It's almost as if to illustrate God's delight of us, listen, Isaiah has to leave the realm of fatherhood and he has to go into motherhood because mothers are far more attentive to their newborn children than fathers typically are. When my kids were young, my oldest now, or my oldest is 15, my youngest is nine. When they were young, I was always amazed, I mean, absolutely amazed at how, at how my wife, Veronica, was aware of their smallest physical features. She, she would say to me, JD, did you notice that Raya has a new freckle behind her left ear? Now, Raya was her, and I'd be like, which one is Raya now? Is it, which, which one is she in that order? Um, no, I'm kidding. I, I knew which one she was, but, but she just was very aware. And somehow she would know when, um, when, when, when one of them would stir. Uh, it used to be that, um, you know, the baby would cry at night and I get up the next morning, I'd be like, woo, that was a great night. Baby slept through the night. And my wife would be like, baby did not sleep through the night. I was up five times with the baby. You were just so out of it that you didn't even know. But she has this like radar just kind of constantly on and she could hear and feel when things were, were going on. Yet God, what he is saying is he, he better, he knows us better and watches us more closely than even the most loving, attentive, love-stricken mother. In fact, Jesus told us in the Gospel of Matthew that our Heavenly Father is so attentive to us that not one hair falls from our heads without our Heavenly Father's knowledge and His, His understanding of it. Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. You know, I know some awesome dads. I do not know any that walk around singing about their children. Oh, Jennifer, you are so pretty, you know, and that's just, it's weird. It, it's almost a little hokey, to be honest, but this is how in love with you, God is. Maybe my favorite description of this is the one by King David in Psalm 139, as David revels in the love of the heavenly father for him. Listen to this. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Lord, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Before anybody else had a name for me, you had a name. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows them very well. Your eyes saw my unformed substance when I was just so called as a fetus. You knew who I was. In your book were written every single one of them, the days that were formed for me, yet when as yet there were none of them. Such knowledge is too wonderful me for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the word, Old Testament word for hell, you're there too. The truth is, by the way, we actually did make our bed in hell and God ran into hell after us and then took hell into his own body for us so that we wouldn't have to experience it eternally. If I have to take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Even there your right hand will hold me. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they would be more numerous than the sands of the seashore. That's how much God thinks about you. 
As many as the sands on the seashore, that's how often and how much he thinks about you. Do you ache to be special to someone? You're special to God. Do you yearn to matter? You matter to God. Do you know how much God thinks about you? He knew you in the womb before anybody else knew who you were. And when you made your bed in hell, he chased you in hell, down into hell after you, and then took hell into himself for you so that he could rescue you by his love. He has more thoughts about you than there are grains of sand on the seashore. Stop and let that just blow your mind for a minute. Do you know how valuable you are to God? My goodness. David says, he says, I I can't get my mind around it. You think about me so much. And that love is deeper and greater and better than any love you ever failed to get from your father. I don't know any other way to say this than that he is crazy about you. And he is more attentive to you than the most love-stricken father. Is there any wonder David said such knowledge is it's too high, it's too wonderful for me? And by the way, before I move on to the second father wound, a lot of you are going to be dads one day. If you want to be a good Christ-like dad, let me give you one piece of advice. Be crazy about your kids and let everybody know about that. Some of the best advice ever given to me was given to me by an older pastor he just looked at me and he said, you need to be your kid's dad and not their pastor. He said, because a pastor is always pointing out what's wrong with you and telling you how you can get better. He said, dad's just really excited about who you are. He says, your kids are going to get plenty of pastoring in the church, but the one thing that you and only you can be to your kids is a dad who's just crazy about them. He said that the dads will be at the one that the game's beaming with pride. A pastor is always kicking you in your tail telling you to, to make more progress. That study I referenced earlier, Families and Faith, Vern Bangston, he said the single greatest factor in determining whether the kids adopt your faith is the quality of the relationship to the kids. Listen, not the quantity of what you teach them. What that means, again, just tuck this away for later, the quality of the devotions that you do with your kids is not as important as the good times that you have with your kids and all the excitement you communicate about them. I'm all for family devotions. I teach my kids lots of things. But more importantly is what I do with them on Saturdays. That's more important than what I do with them in devotions because that's where I show them how crazy I am about them. Number one, the first dad, the first father wound, the first father wound, the never satisfied dad. Number two, the time bomb dad. The time bomb dad. This is the kind of dad you just never knew quite what to expect from him. If he'd had a bad day at work, the smallest thing would set him off. Maybe alcohol or drugs. Maybe that magnified those outbursts. But more than once, you got hurt verbally, emotionally, physically. And of course, you never really learn to love this kind of dad because it's hard to love somebody that you're terrified of. Stephen Poulter says that the negative ramifications that come from this are manifold. He said an incredible number of anxiety disorders have their beginnings in this type of a relationship with a dad. For example, kids who grow up like this can become control freaks. Because see, when their, when their dads exploded, their lives crashed. So they start wanting to control everything to keep that from happening again. In counseling, they call that hypervigilance. Psychologists say it's very similar to PTSD. Uh, Poulter, the author, compares it to the U.S.'s response after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. After the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, we put in a radar system um, so sophisticated it could detect any movement on the Pacific Ocean within a 5,000-mile radius of Pearl Harbor. He said, that's the way these kids grow up. They grow up with just this awareness of where things are going on around them, always on the lookout for where the next blow up might happen and scared not to be fully in control. And of course, that affects how you see your heavenly father. You have a hard time just trusting him or in leaving things in his hand. How can you trust that he'll actually take care of you? What if he's just in a bad mood? And just like with your earthly dad, you're always trying to figure out what you gotta do to contain him, how to stay in his good side. When things start to go wrong in your life, when things start to fall apart, your first thought is, what did I do now? What did I do wrong? And how do I get back on his good side? But your heavenly father is not like the time bomb dad either. You see, David said, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. For some of you, your dad was the opposite of that right there. He was was abounding in anger and he was slow to show affection. Slow to anger? That means he doesn't get angry quickly. Literally in Hebrew, that, that, what that, that reads long of nostrils. We translate it slow to anger, long of nostrils, which I think is a great Hebrew metaphor. He's got big nose. 
Why would that be a metaphor for anger? What happens when you get angry? Your nostrils start to flare, right? I can't really do it well, but your nostrils start to flare. If you're quick-tempered, then those flamey nostrils get going right away. Soon you're like a bull ready to charge. What do you do when you try to control your anger? Well, they tell you to, you know, close your mouth and breathe deeply through your nose slowly. And say some goose for a bow or some statement that'll calm your heart down. Right? God doesn't get going quickly. And he's ready to forgive us the moment that we repent. Think of the father in Jesus' parable who stands after his son has scorned him and run away from him and humiliated him, still stands every day at the edge of the property, looking out in the distance where his son has gone into the far country, longing for him to come home. And the moment he sees his son coming over the horizon, runs to him with the slightest bit of anger gone from his heart and full of overwhelming compassion to bring him back in. Yes, there are times that God disciplines us. There are times he will allow painful things to happen to you. But it's never done in anger, never. For those of us who are his children, it is always for our good. The writer of Hebrews says that even with the best dads, their discipline sometimes gets mixed with some kind of selfish anger, but the discipline of the Heavenly Father is always pure and perfect love with no anger in it at all because all the condemnation and anger for your sin got poured out on Jesus. God promises us in Romans 8, 28, that now what he is doing and all the things that happen in your life, none of them are anger anymore. They're all for your good. God never, if you are a believer, ever responds to you in a way that is pouring out wrath on you. If you are God's child, not one thing has ever happened to you or ever will happen to you that God does not intend for good in your life. Can I ask you a question? If you actually believe that, how would that change how you see things in your life? How would that change how you interpret getting cut from the basketball team? How would that change you not getting into the college that you thought you should get into? How would that change the boyfriend breaking up to you? How would that change the painful chapters in your life? If you understand that your heavenly father who doesn't let a single hair fall from your head without his knowledge and is controlling literally every molecule in the universe for your good, how would that change your attitude toward what is happening in your life? I want you to know that if your dad was the kind who was always angry or you never knew what to expect from him, your heavenly father is the opposite of that. And let me just use this moment to say this you got to stop viewing your heavenly father through the lens of your earthly one. And you've got to reverse that, and you've got to start evaluating your earthly father by the lens of your heavenly one. My friend Jonathan Edwards, who I quoted earlier, said this was the thing that flipped it for him and gave him the ability to trust in God. He started to realize, he said, God was always my real father. My dad was only the replica. He was the stand-in. An earthly dad, he explained, is supposed to be like training wheels. An earthly dad is supposed to be like training wheels teaching you about the Heavenly Father. He said, I had some really bad and uneven training wheels. They were terrible, in fact. He said, but now I know the real Father. And that was the point the whole time, which gives me the ability to cope with all the ways that my heavenly, my earthly Father failed me. So you should reverse the order. Again, here's how you write it down. Stop viewing your Heavenly Father through the lens of your earthly one. Instead, evaluate your earthly father through the lens of your heavenly one. And what that'll do is it will, for the first time in your life, give you the ability to be healthy and to think about forgiveness of your dad, where they disappointed you or hurt you, and give you the ability to go forward in life with confidence instead of insecurity that got put on you by your dad. Here's number three, the emotionally distant dad. This is the kind of dad who may have been stable and consistent. They never abandoned you or abused you. They just never expressed any emotion to you. They never made you feel special. Never told you they were proud of you. Maybe you grew up with a dad like this. One book I was reading said there are three things every child needs to hear from their father consistently. I love you. I'm proud of you. And you are really, really good at you fill in the blank. But maybe you grew up and never heard those things. And what that did is it left you with an insatiable desire to prove yourself so that you could hear those from somebody. Years ago, I filed away the most incredible quote by a guy named Bo Jackson. If you're not into sports, okay, a couple people know who that is. He's a guy that's no longer in professional sports, but many would argue that he's the greatest athlete ever to live, at least in any of our collective memories. He was professional in both football and baseball. 
Here's what he said. Listen to this. This I I read this in a magazine and I've ripped it out. My father has never seen me play a football or a baseball game. Can you imagine? Here I am, Bo Jackson, one of the so-called premier athletes of the country, and I'm sitting in the locker room and envying every one of my teammates, some of whom didn't even get to start or play at all. I was envying those teammates whose dad would just come in and talk and have a drink with them after the game. I never experienced that. Or I think of that great theologian, Will Ferrell, who played Ricky Bobby in Talladega Nights. Right, that's a little more current for you. Remember he always left his dad tickets at Will Call? Remember that? Just hoping that he would show up, but he never came. And that left Ricky Bobby with this insatiable desire to prove himself. By the way, this is also the theme of every single Tom Cruise movie in the 1980s. This dad wasn't there. Poulter, Stephen Poulter said that these kids who grew up in an environment like this not only failed to develop a healthy relationship with their fathers, they struggled to develop relationships, healthy relationships with others because they'd never learned to open up emotionally with anybody. Not their spouses, not their kids. They don't really have close friends. When they go through pain, they tend to do it alone. They might be extroverts with lots of acquaintances, but they don't really have friends that they can depend on. They don't have friends they can go deep with. Tragically, this ends up playing out in a repeating cycle. You end up creating the same kind of emotional distance in your kids. All I'm going to tell you is your Heavenly Father didn't like that. Your Father, Heavenly Father, is so emotionally connected to you that according to Jesus' parable, the prodigal son, he literally said, I cannot be happy. I could not be happy. When you were away, I had to stand, literally get the picture. I'm standing at the edge of heaven and just looking out. There's all kinds of things I could be doing in the house, but I don't want to be there. Because when somebody that I am in love with is hurting, I can't be happy because I've tied my emotional state to theirs. And I used to think that that was a little like blasphemous to talk about God that way, but that's exactly what God says in the book of Hosea. Oh, Israel, I could not have joy until I had brought you back into fellowship with me. Every single day the prodigal son was gone. The father stood at the door waiting for him to come home. I'm sure the father was a busy man. He had lots of things. He just could not be happy when his boy was wandering and hurting and when his son started to come home. This father lifts up the corner of his robe, a sign of indignity in those days, and he ran home to receive his son. By the way, John Piper says that with nearly every other parable Jesus ever told, he ends the parable by giving his hearer something to do. He'd tell a parable and say, likewise, you should go and do also, or you should do this. But in the parable of the prodigal son, it's, it's the only parable, or one of the only parables at least, in which Jesus gives no action step. We are supposed to hear that parable and just stop and worship. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called the children of God. Because see, what you need is not action steps on how to be a better Christian. You understand that? What you need at this conference is not better ways that you can be a witness. What you most need at this conference is to understand who God is in your life. And you gotta understand that by means of knowing that he is the Father. Last one, number four, the absent Father. This is the dad who just physically wasn't there. 40% of children in America, 40% live in fatherless homes. I would imagine it might be less in this room here, but I would imagine there are a number of you that came from homes that were fatherless in some places. That number's much, much higher. Here's what happens. Kids interpret the absence of their dad as a personal rejection. They end up saying, like my friend Jonathan Edwards, I wasn't important enough. I wasn't good enough. That's why dad left. Counselors say this often manifests, listen, in this background sadness, like a soundtrack that just runs in the back of the kid's consciousness that they don't quite understand. It's a fear of aloneness, a nagging suspicion in their lives that any good thing that they have in life is eventually going to go away. You know how when you're watching a movie, you can tell what's about to happen based on the music they're playing? I mean, I've a lot of times thought like, man, if right before bad things happen to me, if they would just somebody would play the music, I would know like this is going to go bad, Right? Because you can tell what's about to come. He's, the, the psychologist said, they said, that's what happens in somebody who's experienced this kind of rejection from their father. Always in their heart is the soundtrack that it's bad. Something bad. And so even in the midst of joys, you're like, oh, it looks good now. But the sinister music is playing. The sad music is playing, which means something's about to go down. Often this sadness and this fear starts to express itself as anger. For many fatherless boys, in the absence of a father figure who could show them what real masculinity was, Well, they turn to some other way to try to prove themselves as men. Rebellion, athletic or sexual prowess, sometimes violence, sometimes even gang activity. 
One author said that fatherless young men gravitate toward aggressive heroes like violent action heroes or even gangster rap stars because they see in them a masculinity that they never got from their dads. It's a skewed masculinity, but it's what they gravitate toward in the absence of authentic masculinity because nobody got on the ground and wrestled with them and showed them what strength under control looked like, what strength harnessed to bless others look like. They learn to express their strength of masculinity through the domination of others. I know some guys who grew up without a present father figure become overachievers. They're always trying to be the man that their father never was to prove themselves so they can get from others the affirmation they never got from their dads. Girls with absentee fathers, and it can manifest in similar ways. Sometimes they struggle to develop respect for themselves, confidence in their careers. Sometimes... In the absence of a father's love, they crave the attention and the care from a man that they never got from their dad, and they become willing to do whatever it takes to get it. Listen to this. One study showed that 90% of female porn models, 90% were sexually abused. Doesn't that break your heart? Guys, why don't you think about that the next time you're tempted to look at pornography? I wonder who it was. Was her dad? Was her uncle? Who was it that first sexually abused this girl that caused her to have such a low view of herself that she would spend her career exploiting her body so that other people could look at her? Chances are the girl that you're gauging at is there because she was either sex trafficked, and even if she chose that career for herself, it was because she developed so low a view of herself because some man taught her early that she was little more than a sex object. So you just ask yourself that when you're tempted to look at it. I wonder who it was in her life. I, chances are a nine out of ten she got sexually abused as a kid and that's why she's doing it i wonder who it was and see if that doesn't change how you objectify and look at that person for somebody that is just as if they exist for your pleasure to be exploited and then discarded well as i hope you see by now jesus is the opposite the opposite of the absentee father in fact he says in hebrews 13 5 i will never 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 leave you or forsake you You know what the Greek word that's translated here never actually means? Never. Never. Never, ever, ever, for any reason, he would not leave you when you had spurned him, when you had walked away from him, when you had told him you didn't want him in your life. He wouldn't leave you if you made your bed in hell. Far from being the kind of dad who would walk out to pursue a better option. He had a better option. He couldn't be happy until you had returned home. Far from using you for his own pleasure, he allowed himself to be abused and tortured for you so that you could have eternal life. As they pounded nails into his wrist for you, all Jesus could pray was, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Far from being somebody who uses you for pleasure, he gave himself for you. So what I'm trying to show you is that Jesus is the heavenly father that you've always craved. You were created for fellowship in this trinity. What Jesus told his disciples, John 17, is I'm going to my father and your father. He is going to be this to you, what he is to me. The love that he has for me, he has it for you. Even if you had a good dad, at some point he disappointed you and he failed you. Here's another reality. Even the best dads die. They're not gonna be around forever. And when they die, they leave this big gaping hole in your heart that you don't know how to feel. That's why I love that Isaiah the prophet adds the word everlasting. He's the everlasting father. He never disappoints. He never forsakes. He never leaves. He never dies. He's the father that you've always craved. So let me repeat this again. Do not judge your heavenly father by your earthly one. Evaluate your earthly father by your heavenly one. He's the father you've been searching for. And when you realize that, you can heal You can heal from the wounds and the disappointments left by your earthly father. And in many cases, you can learn to forgive him and maybe even love him again. And you can develop the confidence to go around the world wherever God tells you to go because you know that if God is for me, who can be against me? Jesus wants to heal many of you this weekend from the wounds that have been left in your life by the heaven, by your earthly father. Zephaniah 3, 17, the Lord again will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. I love that phrase, quiets you by his love. Sometimes I'll be at home. I have a a home office and I'll be in there working. And this happened the other day. I heard this cry in the distance. Keeps getting louder. I'm like, they're coming for me. 
got louder and louder. And all of a sudden, the door of my office burst open, and it's my, my little girl, my third little girl. She bust in, and she got tears coming down her face, and she got a big scrape on her knee, and she hops up in my lap, and she's just, you know, I'm like, what's wrong, honey? And she's like, <laughs> she didn't, we can't speak. And I'm like, honey, it's going to be okay. You know, it's going to be okay. And she just keeps on with the moaning and the, you know, and I, I'm like, so I'm just, so I just whisper in her ear. I start praying for her. I'm like, Jesus, Lord, quiet Raya with your love. Take the alleys away. Help Raya to settle down. And as I'm praying for her and I'm holding her there in my lap, I can just feel her body lose its tension. I can feel her start to relax. I can feel her begin to calm because of the safety she feels in the arms of her dad. See, maybe that's you today. Life has left you with bloody knees, bloody elbows. And here's the thing, nobody sitting next to you has any idea what you carry around. Nobody has any idea the pain that you walk around with. Nobody has any idea what you're going through when you come in here tonight. But I'll tell you what, when you go running and screaming and you jump into the arms of the Heavenly Father, what He's going to do, according to Zephaniah 3, is He's going to start whispering in your ear. He's going to start praying for you, and He's going to calm you. He's going to give you His peace, and He's going to say to you, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far I moved your transgressions from you. That I gave up everything for you because you were precious to me as high as the heavens are above the earth. That's how great my love is for you. Nothing can separate you from my love. Not height, nor depth, nor principality, or power. Not anything in heaven or in earth because you are mine. I have put you in the palm of my hand and nothing can pull you out of my hand. And I'm in the Father's hand and we're both in the Father's hand. And nobody can take anybody out of the Father's hand. I'll never leave you or forsake you, and there's not a hair of your head that falls that is not done without my knowledge, and I have marshaled every molecule in the universe to pursue your good, and he will sing that over you. That's the promise that your heavenly Father gives. And when you believe that, when he tells you to go, you'll trust him, because you'll say, I'd rather be anywhere with him than I would be anywhere without him. And I'll go to the place, to the one who never forsakes me and always has my best interest at heart and who will always take care of me. Here's a question. Do you know the love of your heavenly father? Do you know it? Because you can this very night. The good news of the gospel is that when you as a child wandered away and you turned your back on God, God came to earth to bear the penalty in your place. Jesus was dying in your place. He was taking the penalty for your rebellion. He died in your place so that whosoever received him, whoever would just receive him, surrender to him and receive him, he would restore you. That's the gospel. And that's where Christianity starts. That's where you find your identity in the arms of the heavenly father. Why don't you bow your heads if you would. Bow your heads. Let me just ask you this very, very clearly, okay? Do you know for sure? Do you know for sure that you've received the love of the heavenly father? You don't get it by going to church. You don't get it by coming to a conference like this one. You get it by opening up your heart to Jesus. In one place in the Bible, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. That's a great image, a great analogy for what's happening right now to you. Have you ever surrendered to Jesus and just received his love? If not, here's what it would sound like. You could pray these very words after me. Jesus, I know, I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm ready to come home to you. Say it to him, I'm ready for you to be my Lord. I'm ready for you to be Lord. I believe you died in my place. Tell him that. I believe you died in my place for my sin. I receive your offer of salvation. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that right now with me, would you do this? Would you just raise your hand? Just raise it up all over this place. Say, tonight I prayed that prayer and I'm receiving Jesus as my Savior. Don't be embarrassed. Just hold it up, okay? Hold it up for just a minute all over this place. Hold it up. Hold it up. Father, I pray for every hand that is raised. I pray for every hand that's raised that I could see and the ones that I could not see. God, I pray that you would complete what you're doing in them and give them the identity that comes from releasing themselves into the arms of the Heavenly Father. I ask that God in Jesus' name.